Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Are you doing okay? Good to see you. Everybody good? All right. I want to talk to you about expectancy and expectations. When I say the word expectancy, what do you think about? <laughs> Usually, we attach that word to an expecting mother. Uh, some of the message that I'm going to share with you tonight is taken from a book, Hope Beyond Disappointment by David Hess. Uh, and in the first chapter, he talks about this expectancy and living in the place of an expectant heart. I, I don't know about you, but when I came here tonight, I, was, I, I, I had some expectancy. I, I'm looking for something. I'm anticipating something taking place. Classically, when we talk about expectancy, we talk about a lady, a pregnant woman, and how they have a baby. Okay, how many of you are out there moms that, that have delivered a baby? Okay, well, let me ask you a question. What is it that gets you through the pain of childbirth? Drugs, yeah, I knew that was coming. <laughs> is it not the expectancy of see, seeing and holding this little one? that's inside of you. Uh, uh, you look forward to a moment, you look forward to something that's bigger than the moment that you're presently in. Expectancy actually is the state of thinking or hoping that something, especially something pleasant, is gonna happen. It, it's, it's, it's an anticipation. One of my favorite passages in the Bible is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, you know, I, I, I love that passage. Because it is such a picture of expectancy. Watch Jesus expectantly work in the garden. You know, he's having this communication with the Father. You and I have, have cell phones nowadays. Hey, Dad, you know, how you doing? Just want to stop by and check and see if we still have the same plan that we did before. Are we still working on the same plans? Tomorrow's the big day. You know, just checking in with you. He's, he's in the garden now. Uh, uh, just seeing if we're going to do anything different, you know. No, no? Oh, okay, I was just checking in. Tonight would be a good night to find out if there's anything that's, that's uh, going to change, but, but we're all good. Not, not by will, but, you know, you, your will be done. And I was just checking in, though. Make sure everything's all right. Uh, we'll see you guys in a few. <laughs> Jesus walks into the garden knowing that in, he's in the middle of his destiny. He's in the middle of his Father's will, and he has this great expectancy of what's going to happen on the other side of tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to be a doozy. So he really needs expectancy to carry him through. Expectancy is this attitude and decision that attaches my heart to the joy on the other side of what I'm presently standing in. Are you all okay with that? Say it again. Expectancy is this attitude and decision that attaches my heart to the joy that's on the other side of what I'm presently standing in. So it's that joy, that expectancy that's going to pull me through. Now, th th this, is, this is the crux, the basis uh, of everything I'm going to share with you tonight. That expectant joy, that expectancy is anchored on three foundational thoughts. You've got to lock these in. Number one, God is good. How many of you believe that? I mean, he's absolutely good. God is good. Okay, here's the second thought. He is for me. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, that doesn't mean going on welfare, I mean, you know, a good, <laughs> and not for calamity, to give you a future and to give you a hope. Wow, God's for me. Here's a third thought. He is with me. God's good, God's for me, and he is with me, and because he's with me, he's carrying me. I, I, you know, I think about the children of Israel when they're walking through the wilderness following the cloud by day and the fire by night. Uh, the Red Sea opens up, manna, quail, all that kind of stuff, water from the rock. It not only speaks of the presence of God, but it also speaks of his provision and his protection. Now, if, if I don't have an anchored expectancy, what can happen is I will create expectations. 
And these expectations are like creating a little box. It creates a place where we give God permission to do his stuff. We give God permission to happen. And often we call this process of moving from expectancy to expectation, we frequently call it prayer. Okay, uh, you know, uh, here are the things you can do, Lord, and, 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 and I'm going to be okay with that, and, and I'm okay as long as I'm in control. I want you to go back to the garden again. Jesus is talking to the Father. He says, okay, is that, that what we're going to do? Father, uh, okay, not my will, but your will be done. And, 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 but here's what I want to happen tomorrow, and here's how I want it to go. And I don't want my disciples to be too upset, so give them a little bit of peace. And, 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 and you know, for heaven's sake, please help my mom, because give her a revelation of what's going on uh, so she doesn't pass out in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> how, how many of you understand that that's not a, that's not a uh, 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 expectancy, but rather it's an expectation? It's not a conversation of expectancy. It's a conversation of, God, here, here's the box, and, and here's what I'm okay with you working within. Let me give you an idea of what the conversation of expectancy might sound like. All right, here we go, Dad. Uh, I'm with you. I, I trust that you, you're there. You're here. You're everywhere in between. Here we go. Here, here we go. I trust you. Do you get the difference? But when I begin to define what can happen, my expectations, I literally put God in a box. Now, please understand, please understand, when you put God in a box, he's not there. Did you get that? <laughs> he's not there. You're there, but he's not there. And that's so important to know because when you do this, it sets you up for incredible disappointment because you really don't know what's going to happen, do you? Come on, shake your head this way. You think you may know what's happened based on what's happened before, but how many of you would say, Bob, the longer I walk in this life, the more I realize every time I try to ask, guess God, I, he doesn't do it the way I think he's going to do it. You probably have already figured this out in your infinite wisdom. You think you may know some of the possible outcomes, but when it doesn't happen the way that you thought it was going to happen, you get disappointed. That's a really good point, Bob. I, I appreciate that. That's good. <laughs> because you're not God. And, and you, you ever notice that God has to kind of take us through this process on a reoccurring basis just to remind us of that fact? Most of our prayer life is talking to God. It's processing what's going on in our life with God. Uh, and asking his blessing on whatever our ideas are. God, I'm thinking about going here and doing this, and I'm going to be okay if you do these things. But if you don't do these things, I'm not going to be so okay. Uh, uh, we got an agreement now, right? Amen. <laughs> so you're moving along in your expectancy. Remember? Expectancy is this attitude. It's a decision that attaches your heart to the joy that's on the other side of what you're presently standing in. And your joy is anchored in three things. Number one, God is good. Come on. Number two, God is for me. He has a fantastic, exciting plan for me. And number three, He will provide and protect me. But when I turn my thoughts to to the circumstances, I tend to get distracted. And then I tend to lock onto my list of expectations, my box. And when they don't come to pass the way I thought that they would, I get disappointed, I get disillusioned, I get angry, I get offended. I've taught here several times on offense. And one of the two primary contributors to offense, number one, is unfulfilled expectation. Somebody makes a promise to you and they don't come through with that promise. Expectation. We get offended. The other primary contributor or ingredient to an offense is a violated right. Just for your own little side notes. And amidst that offense, I miss everything that he's doing. Are you listening okay? I miss everything that he's doing because I'm focusing on what he's not doing. Pause for a, for a moment. Do you remember how John the Baptist ended up 
in prison. This is the guy who has the great revelation, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And he ends up in prison and he's saying, go back disciples and ask this guy, is he really the one or should I look for another? How did he end up in such doubt and unbelief? Because he was focusing on what God was not doing rather than on what God is doing or has done. I hope you got that. For some of you, that will be the whole evening for you. And when we focus on what God is not doing, we disconnect ourselves from God. Now I'm disconnected. I'm isolated. I'm disconnected from God's purposes for me. And so in doing, I essentially become somebody else. I have to put on a mask. I become unrecognizable to my own destiny because I don't know who to blame for my own hurt. In the back of my mind, I think, God didn't come through. He failed. He didn't heal. He didn't deliver. He didn't provide. This is an incredibly important truth because when I get disconnected from God as a result, I disconnect from who I am. I disconnect from my identity. I have some news for you. He didn't go away. But we are the ones that isolate ourselves. And if you have an ear to hear this, your destiny is your identity. You don't do what you do to become who you are. You do what you do because of who you are. Wow, Bob, that's a great point. That's just really good. (laughs) Proverbs 18 verse 1 says, When a man isolates himself, he seeks his own desire. So I seek my own desire. I have this list of how things ought to go. I set my own course. It might not be the greatest, of course, but I set my own course. And you can't talk me out of my expectations. So my expectations literally create this box. And this box becomes a trap. A trap of expectations, a trap of limitations, a trap of lack. And they turn me from my line and from my destiny. So now I have a box of expectations. How I think things ought to work out. These expectations come and they build, they come with built-in stress and anxiety. I know none of you have stress and anxiety. I'm just throwing that out for extra. <laughs> And this anxiety and this stress produces a need for me to control. How many of you know the number one response to fear, the number one defense mechanism to fear or anxiety is control? So it creates this desire to be in control. And this is how I end up playing God. I live each day anxious about my plans, working out the way I plan for them to work, whether it's with my family, my finances, my health, opportunities in life, whatever it is. I'm so anxious about the things not working out the way that I want them to work out. So I go to work controlling them. See the anxiety of wanting something so desperately, it turns me away from an expectant open heart that is connected to hope. How many of you know hope is the fuel that moves me through the obstacles and through the pain and through the fear? So when I have this heart of expectancy, I have a heart that's anchored in hope. And all of a sudden, the things that I'm afraid of, he turns into something amazing. It's so amazing, I can't even believe what he did with it. Uh, 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 I would not have thought of this, but I'm so glad that I'm here. I'm so thankful that I'm here. I don't want to do it again, but it's, it's, <laughs> but it's awesome what he did with it. How many of you can say, yep, yeah, that's, that's times in my life. The older I become the more I thought I knew how things would work out. But the more I've realized how little I know. I don't intend to create a list of expectations. But here is how you know that you have expectations, how you've created your own little box that you're in and God is not in. Here's how you know. When something doesn't work out, it freaks you out. That's evidence that you've created a box. An expectation box. That's how you know that you have a whole pile of expectations going on. And and the funny thing is, is most frequently we think that's something we call faith. (laughs) No, it's your creative power to limit God to your list. I hope you're getting this. This is awesome stuff. (laughs) And that comes from being familiar with the process. We treat God like he's a Coke machine. We put money in. And we think a Coke's going to come out every time, but how many of you realize God is a little bit trickier than a Coke machine? So when I keep my expectancy on, 
It changes the way I experience everything. Everything is different when I'm standing in my God-given purpose, which means I know He is good, He is for me, and He is with me. Can you say those three together out loud? He is good. Come on. He is for me, and He is with me. As a matter of fact, I cannot name one thing in my life that has not worked out, not one. Now, I'm not saying it hasn't worked out the way that I had planned, but I can't think of one thing that hasn't worked out for good. It may have felt like the end of the world at the time, but somehow it worked out. I don't know how it worked out, but it did. And how does this keep happening? Very simple, because he's God and I'm not. He's God and you're not. And periodically, I I think we each need to be reminded of that, don't we? Then when I look around and I can't find him and I say, hey, hey, where'd you go? God reminds me that he is outside the box. He is outside of my box. Is he outside of yours? He looks at me when I climb into my box and he says, how does it feel in there? Terrible. (laughs) Every time I step in a box that I made for him, it's terrible because I find out he's not there, but I am. So what do I have to do? I have to get back into an attitude of expectancy. I have to refocus my conscious thoughts to the truth that God is good, God is for me, and God is with me. Can Can you say those three with me? I want you to focus on him. God is good. Come on. God is for me, and God is with me. He's providing and protecting. That's the God of covenant. It's the God of our destiny. He is the God that when he says it will happen, how many of you know it's going to happen? Can you imagine God saying to Abraham, hey, Abraham, you know, you're going to be the father of more people than are the stars of the heaven, more than the sand of the sea. That's you. And Abraham doesn't doesn't say to God, well, wow, God, you know, that's going to take a while. (laughs) I'm going to be so old by the time that promise happens. No, he's an eternal God. I'm on an eternal journey. I'm on a quest. And so much of my life is going to happen today, tomorrow, this week, next week, next month. How many of you realize that so much of your life is going to be on the other side? Other side of what? Many of the promises God gives you, the things that he stirs in your heart, the passions that he puts inside your life, they may not actually just be for you. They may be for your children and your children's children. So what do I do? Very simply. First, I I set God's words before me. I focus on the promises he's made to me. That creates hope inside of me. And, And when hope is present... Faith is active. Did you get that? You need to be writing that one down. When hope is present, faith is active. What's the opposite of that? When hope is not present, faith is not active. And then I think on these thoughts. These are the thoughts that meditate and fill my mind. Number one, God is good. You could think on that all day, couldn't you? He's good. Secondly, God is for me. He has a plan. He has a purpose. He has a destiny for me. He is for me. And thirdly, God is with me. I focus on these three. I cause my heart to be attached to these through a decision to believe them. So now expectancy becomes an attitude and a decision. As I have this focus and my mind and my heart are filled with these attributes, I realize that I'm standing in expectancy. I'm expecting, God, you're so good. And my response to your goodness is, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. As I stand in the middle of this flow, I know that I'm in the flow because no matter what's going on, I can continue to say, thank you. No matter that what happens, I say, thank you. You're awesome. You're good. You're for me. You're with me right here, right today. Men and women, this is why we praise in the midst of adversity. Because I know what's waiting on the other side. And I'm not talking about the other side is in heaven. And it is something so beyond what I could have created for my own life. 
It's beyond my wildest imaginations. Not necessarily what I would have done. I usually can think of an easier way to get through some things. Because what I just went through, it may have felt like what you just went through, may have felt like you were going to die. So I've learned to pray. Lord, could you possibly let me in a little bit more on the next one that you're going to do? <laughs> I, I, I just seem to settle down so much more when I have some good information, you know. Hmm. I, I, is that asking too much? But not my will, but your will be done because you are good and you are for me and you are with me. So my expectancy is on. God gets to be God. And if I take my eyes off of God, this is my conscious trust connection. If I take my eyes off of God, then my heart attaches to fear and anxiety and things which precipitate me trying to control. It's a horrible exchange. But we frequently make it anyway, don't we? We do. We make the trade because we become afraid. Because keeping our expectancy on, staying expectant, staying in the place of you're good, you're with me, you're for me, you know what you're doing, it's a place of vulnerability. But that's what he's asking from us. He's asking our hearts. He's asking for our lives. He's asking to just be given what he bought. Give it to me. Give it to me, and I will show you beyond your wildest expectations what an abundant life really looks like. But you have to stay vulnerable. You have to stay open. And he has to be God. I remember several years ago, Anthony, a couple that you know, that you go to regularly in the States, John, and his wife then was Anna. Both of these were raised up in our church, uh, equipped, sent out from our church, spiritual sons and daughters. They get, gave us a call and asked us to pray for her. She was battling breast cancer. Now, this couple is very special to us. Uh, Anna's been going into them for, for many years. And she went for several treatments, finally got a report back that Everything was in remission, fantastic, prayers working, chemo, something was working. <laughs> so for a couple of years, we didn't hear anything negative. Then it happened. You know, the telephone call. The cancer's back. But this time, it's also in the kidneys and in the liver. So we begin to pray and really war, pouring everything we knew into this sweet lady, 41, 2, 3 years old, getting up out of her bed, going back to her four children. and It's an amazing atmosphere. People are prophesying, sending scriptures, well-known preachers and their wives are calling out of nowhere, giving words of encouragement. We were confident that her healing was going to happen. For several months we did this. Then one morning at 3 a.m. I got the telephone call. And has passed away. My heart's broken. I'm baffled. At the funeral, we had about 1,500 people. That's a huge funeral. We're go I'm going through this entire experience. When we get back home, I didn't realize, though, amidst all of this, I had set expectations. And they didn't get fulfilled. And now I stepped into a place where I'm very angry at God. I had a list of things that he could do, should do. I had the theology to back it all up. This is how it ought to work. My emotions and my heart were disconnected from him. I'm trying to be a pastor to pastors, and here I am, just a mess. Disconnected from God. It's bad. I'm so discouraged. I'm afraid. I'm hurt. God, you really have to talk to me. So I'm reading my Bible one morning, and I heard the, the Lord speak the name Ezekiel. And I thought, oh, no, I'm not going to read Ezekiel. I mean, I don't even understand Ezekiel after a prophetic conference. I mean, you know, the man, the lion, the eagle, the faces, the wheel, I don't get it all. Uh, 
I don't have the energy to go read Ezekiel. So I prayed, God, can we do something else? And I heard again the word Ezekiel. All right, I'd ask for help. Ezekiel it is. So I turned to Ezekiel, first chapter, and there it was. Man's face, lion, eagle's faces, wheel, all that stuff. All in the first chapter. And then I get to the very bottom where the footnotes are in my Bible. And I read, Ezekiel means God will strengthen. I wrote the whole chapter just to get to the footnote, but there it was. And I burst into tears. God, you are talking to me. You are here. And pretty soon I could feel the refreshing. His presence was everywhere. And it was just a little turn. I went from my way be done to you are the God of destiny and you are the God of purpose. Now I'm back on the path. I'm in the flow. All of a sudden, I'm being carried along. That's what's happening. God is good. God is for me. God is with me. Previously, I was trapped. Trapped right here in my heart. I'd built a box of expectations. And I tried to fill it with what I understood the purposes of God to be. But I want you to understand, your destiny wants nothing to do with your box. Hope comes along and hope says, you know what, let's try it one more time, one more time. And I, and I feel this, is, this has got, uh, I went from a hopeless impossibility to kind of a look at me now beyond my wildest expectations. Because I think the Lord is saying to us today in, in this time right now with so much going on, whatever you're doing, reading your Facebook, watching the news, whatever, don't create a box and a list of what God can do and he can't do. Don't do that. Stay in this line of expectant hope where you look to God and you're saying, God, you are good. Come on. God, you are with me. God, you are for me. You are my daddy. And when you really see him as your daddy, it ought to trigger within you this childlike expectation. What are we going to do now, Dad? Oh, man, that's awesome. That's awesome. I, I, I'm excited. Let's go have an ice cream. Now what are we going to do? This is the foundation. This is where we're anchored in praying, Daddy, what do you want to do now? Rather than creating a box with our, why didn't you do this? Focusing on what has not happened. Why didn't this happen? Why isn't this working? Why, why, why? It's a wrong question. I've raised three kids. We have eight grandkids. They frequently spend the night with us. And I've learned over the years that when kids ask you why, why can't I go to a friend's house to spend the night? Why? It's really not a question. It's a commentary that's saying, I don't like your decision, try again. <laughs> so when I stand and I say to God, why, 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 it's really not a question. It's our commentary saying, I, I don't like your decision, I don't like your tactics. If I were God, I wouldn't do it this way. The response really is, wow, awesome, okay. What are you going to do now? What do you want me to do? What, what, what? That's the right question. I stay in the hope. I stay in the expectancy. I stay in my line of purpose and destiny. God, you're good. God, you are for me. God, you are with me. So expectancy or expectations? You're going to create a box? If you do, you're going to find out God's not in that box. Or are you going to keep a heart of expectancy that's anchored on those critical, important three questions? Are you all okay with this? Make some sense. Come on, stand to your feet. You've been great. Stand to your feet. Find someone around you, put your arm around your neighbor, hold their hand. If you're single, this is your moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I want you to pray for the person that you got your arm around. Pray that God will open expectancy in their heart. Come on. <laughs> Come on, just whisper a little prayer. God, open expectancy in their heart. God, open our eyes. That we're able to choose. That we're able to receive, to hear. You're good. You're with me. You're for me. You're good. You're with me. You're for me. Come on. God, you're good. You're with me. You're for me. And Lord, whatever they're facing, help them to have a joy to know how good Daddy is in the midst of any situation. Come on. Holy Spirit, come. Saturate our hearts. Tenderize our hearts. Daddy, forgive us where we've stood in judgment of you. Where we've insisted we're right and you're wrong. Please forgive us. Wash all that away. Wash away the limits, the confinements, our judgments, our expectations. And reconnect us to a heart of hope and anticipation. You know why I anticipate? Because I know he's good. Do you know why I anticipate? Because I know he's with me. Do you know why I have a heart of expectancy, anticipation? Because I know he's for me. Our hope is in you, God. So what, no matter what the challenge is today, We speak, we place our trust in you because you're an awesome daddy. You okay? God bless you. Pastor. All right, thanks, Bob. Appreciate that. We're going to do one more song and we're going to give as we, uh, as we sing, like the guys come be ready to receive. Uh, and an interesting experience with um, with Riley the other week in the car. He, um, of course, he's five, and we're going through the whole thing. So, who is who is who is your mummy, and who is your daddy, and who's grandma's mummy, and who's grandma's daddy? And we were trying to figure all this out, you know, of all this interrelational um, thing. And um, and and I said, well. I'm your granddad, right? Well, who's your daddy going through all the thing? And I'm your granddad. And he said, no, you're not. I said, yeah, okay, so here's the, this is your, Connie's your mummy, and I'm mummy's daddy, but that means I'm your granddad. He said, no, you're not. <laughs> so I said, okay, now let's run this through. Mummy, I'm mummy's daddy, which means that I'm your Granddad, he got really angry, and he said, no, you're not. You're my dad. And uh, in that moment, I realized that I was to Riley who we believed that I was. So it mattered not whether I was biologically, physically, genetically his granddad. I was to him who he believed that I was, and I am to him who he believes that I am. Here's the little lesson out of all that. God is to you who you believe that God is. God said, I am to you who you believe I am to you. So for those of you, is this distant, ethereal, he is who you believe him to be to you. But if you will believe him to be to you tonight, the good, the faithful, the kind, the Father, that's exactly who He is and who He will be. And I want you to receive that and experience that tonight. All right, so the guys are going to sing. We're going to receive the offering. We bless you in Jesus' name. Hang around, have a coffee, and uh, we love you, and we'll see you again. Thanks for listening. You might not be aware that The Rock is funded completely through donations from people like yourself. So if you feel like you're part of our community, it would be great if you could make a contribution by visiting our website at www.rockofyork.co.uk and just click on the donate button for more information. Thanks again.